are the building people, which are uh, Cisco. We also have sponsors with uh, Cisco Press, and they always give us a few books here. So we've got the uh, CCNP version 2, we've got a CCNA security, we've got a CCDP <coughs> study guide, and we have a Todd Lamley CCNA data center. I think that's Todd. Yeah. So Wiley and Cisco Press. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Wiley. So this is Wiley Press, right? And uh, they're also one of our gold sponsors. So it's very important that we plug the sponsors. We plug the sponsors. If we don't, we lose our books. So if you win a book by chance, you ought to, you ought to send an email over to the Cisco Press and say, thank you. Send me another one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what we do is we I take pictures it, it, if it's okay with the winner, and we send them in to the uh, marketing person, and they try to use them for their blogs. Mm -hmm. Definitely, uh, Cisco Press does that. Yep, so. and they've been good to us for a lot of years. So, like I say, even if you don't win a book, tell them, "Hey, my buddy won a book. He was happy." Um, whatever. So also talk to your account manager and make sure they understand that we appreciate the fact that they let us come here in the building and, and uh, have a meeting every month. It's kind of a small turnout tonight. What do you think? Is uh, vacation starting or anything? Or did the rain wash everybody's road? Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, okay. Is that what's going on tonight? Uh, all week. Uh, all week. Didn't think about that. Oh, that, that age. Well, everybody go home. We're going to come back next week. Okay. <laughs> after, after you graduate. Yes. Bring the graduates. <laughs> right. So you want to talk about our? And, and I'll, I'll go ahead and mention just along with the books, right quick. Uh, we'll hand out tickets, and uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll wrap off with books and things like that. I'd also like to make sure everybody knows Bo Williamson. Bo was one of the original founders, along with Tom O'Keefe. Tom, do you want to raise your hand? Raise your hand. <laughs> so the three of us kicked this thing off back in 1996, and Tom ran it for, I don't know, like 10 years. I've run it for give or take 10 years. And I think Bo Williamson is uh, going to end up taking that role. So uh, right now he's accepted a vice presidency position, and uh, which replaces Eric Segerson that you guys know that left. And Bo will eventually end up uh, taking the presidency because I'm going to step down and let it let it roll on uh, Bo's shoulders for. You wanted to step down years. just straight away and go straight to the beach and sit there with a drink in his hand, but I told him I was happy to take over the role, but he had to provide a transition period where. He was my mentor and I was his grasshopper in terms of <laughs> some of the infrastructure he <clears throat> set up over the years. Uh, so that's what we agreed to. So, so I'd, I'd like to have everybody welcome Bo. Let me be a little premature. We need to give Ken a round of applause. <laughs> a big retirement party when he finally decides he's not coming in. You, you must, it is a requirement, mm -hmm. that you tell us when your last meeting is going to be as opposed to just disappearing. disappearing? Yes. So, that or not. Yeah, we, we can celebrate uh, your exit appropriately. Uh, that's right, we'll bring a rail or, no, no, that's a different thing. But anyway, we, we ought to do something special just to say thank you. So I'd like to go ahead and turn this meeting over to Bo, let him run it tonight, and I'll kind of sit the back. May, it may actually go very, very quickly because we don't have all that many people here, but let's go through the usual uh, procedure and start off, see if we have anybody on this side of the room that is attending the user group for your first time. So raise your hand. Anyone? All right. <laughs> Sir, if you'd stand up, tell us who you are. Uh, how you learned about the user group and kind of what you hope to get out of the user group. All right, yeah, my name is Giorgio Spina. Um, I was introduced by Charles Chang here. He's one of my co coworkers. Um, I work at Pfizer as a network engineer, and I'm looking to see what the group has to offer. Just checking it out mainly for now. Okay, very good. Welcome, welcome to the meeting. There was somebody else back here, I think. Yes, sir. 
Kevin Ward, I work with AT&T. Um, I've known about the group for <coughs> years now. I just never had a chance to come by and check it out. Yeah. Glad you made it here. Okay. That better late than never. There you go. <laughs> How about on this side? Of it? Was there anybody else over here that I saw? I only saw two hands. Okay, over here. Aren't you new? No. <laughs> Anybody here? Is this your first time showing up yeah, in the industry? Okay. Like I said, I figured that's going to be a very long close to break. Yeah, I, th I think Ken made it a special deal to make sure not as many people came so that my first night here wouldn't be so hard on <laughs> <laughs> He's a little shy, so we, we wanted to limit the number of people. I'm not, not really accustomed to public speaking. And more, right. cake, and more <laughs> cake for all of us. Yeah, well, there is. Yes. I really need more cake. You know. <laughs> In the old days, we had beer. <laughs> See, what? All right. So while we're here, um, let's go around the room and see if there's anybody here that is uh, looking for a, a job, uh, has a job to be filled. Or you feel like you're underemployed and you want to move up to another position. So anybody in that particular boat or the side, on the either side, I guess. We're all gainfully employed and being paid exactly what we're worth. Is that right? Uh, 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 nobody needs a raise. You, in fact, you refused the last raise because you were being paid too much, right? Oh, no. Okay. Somebody back here. Yes, sir. So, um, my name is Prashant. I'm a graduate student. I'm going to graduate next month from with my master's degree in communication and network from University of North Texas. Um, I'm just started to look for my intelligible for any position in network, and I'm holding already the next time. Okay, so you're so starting, starting to work on your CCNA? Yes. Okay, and you're looking for an entry position. Thank you. Well, that's great. So, with that, I think that's a perfect segue for Mark and Chris to talk just a little bit about where do we stand on our user groups? Do we have any, any study groups? <laughs> study groups, one of them group things. Uh, <laughs> just very quickly, Mark and Chris are, as, as many of you already know, our directors of education or study groups or whatever you want to call your title. Um, I assume that you'll probably want to get people together after the meeting to kind of get organized, but for those that are maybe brand new, you might give a quick overview of what this is all about. Sure, and, and um, I would also use this opportunity to recognize our two uh, incoming uh, study group officers, Brian and Matt, if you wouldn't do me a favor and stand up. Sure. Uh, so Brian and Matt have uh, volunteered to help us out. They will um, be taking over. I'm, I'm handing off the hat of study group uh, coordinator, facilitator uh, to these guys. So they will be taking over my my spiel that I give at the beginning. They'll be giving that now. I'll be moving into more of uh, uh, working with Cisco, uh, trying to improve the meeting, doing some telepresence and outreach type things. Um, but Matt and Brian are both veterans of our study groups. Um, I believe they both led a study group at this point, or they co-led uh, multiple study groups at this point. Um, you know, if you guys are looking to get a certification, um, Brian, you, you got CCNP, CCNA data center off of the study groups? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I think it's CCNA, CCNP off of the study group. We're working on your CCNP. Right, right. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, any, they, any day now, any day now, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're good ways to, you know, meet different people who are like-minded uh, and to learn from people who have different sets who are at, at a similar level and who have a different set of experience that you do. Um, you know, I, I work, I have worked entirely in service provider networks, so an EIGRP network to me is, you know, it, it's like, what, what is this thing that I'm monkeying around in, right? And similarly, somebody on the enterprise side, vice versa. What is this OSDF thing, and why do areas matter? Um, you know, they, we can learn from each other, right? I can help them with OSDF, they can help me with the IGR. So it certainly helps. Uh, we're always looking for folks who are willing to lead study groups. Um, study groups really kind of kick off with leaders. 
you're willing to put the time in to coordinate and put it together, um, that's kind of what it gets started. So now that's what a leader is. In essence, you're kind of a cat herder for the whole <laughs> process of, okay, everybody, we're all going to get together on this schedule. And this is the material we're going to go with. Um, and the end goal is to try to take a test by this date. Uh, they don't teach. Uh, they're not the person who's always, okay, so you're not, this you, is the topic, and I'm going to go over this. You, you don't, you, you're not the smartest person in the room. But, but I, I, I can attest to that. I have led multiple study groups now. I don't think I've been the smartest one in any of them. Uh, so certainly that's not necessarily what you have to be. You just have to kind of be the, uh, the hub. You, you get requests in, you kick the requests back out and say, what do you guys think about this? That's kind of your function. So it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, You're a logistics coordinator. You coordinate where we're going to meet, when we're going to meet, you can print make sure everybody gets you know, the word out about when we're going to meet. You may work with the group and publish a schedule of, all right, this is what we think we need to be studying on these dates, so now go home and read up on that and be prepared to discuss. But like they say, you're not going to get up there and do a presentation on the slides and talk about OSPF cost and, you know, the, the it, the Dijkstra algorithm. Unless you really, unless you really want to. Yeah. And it, this could be voluntary. And you, you may have somebody who wants to do that, so it's, it's totally voluntary. Um, I will say we, you know, I kind of show of hands. I heard uh, CCNA in the back. I'm assuming that's route switch. Okay. Um, it's, it's all. I, I always make that assumption. That's always not always a good <laughs> assumption to make. But um, if right. anybody. Uh, there's a CCNP route switch group uh, that is in the process of forming. Is anybody uh, interested in another study group or certification? Okay. Okay. Well, if you are, certainly come find me. Come hit me up. Um, actually, I'm sorry. Come hit these guys up. <laughs> find them so it looks like you're coming to talk to me. But they has got the little yeah. arm thing. Yeah. So he manipulates them. And if you know somebody else who wasn't able to make it to the meeting tonight, uh, have them uh, check out the other websites and uh, look up our email address. Send us a note so we can try to help them uh, get into a group. Speaking of officers moving from one role to a new role, thank you guys. You can sit down if you want. Or you can stand up. <laughs> um, a week ago or so, we had a officers meeting, kind of a quarterly officers meeting. We got together with the goals of, all right, let's talk about what can we do with the user group to make it better, to have a broader outreach, and we discussed things. And you guys help me if I miss something. Uh, key to it, uh, Chris is going to work on uh, the multimedia so that we start using WebEx to at least initially record all the meetings that can be put up on a web page. Along that line, Ken has an action item to help us get a YouTube DFW Cisco user group channel that we start hosting them. Uh, then we hope maybe to reach out to people that can't drive in from Fort Worth every time and they can actually tune into the WebEx once we kind of work maybe through some issues there uh, and see if that's going to work out. And then maybe we're looking for volunteers to maybe help do a little post-production, put maybe a leader or trailer on the video before we stick it up on YouTube to make it look a little slicker. Um, so we, we've also talked about, do we want to actually take the step and turn the user group into a, a 501c3? And what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? What can we do with that? That might allow us to bring in money. If we bring in money, we might be able to start setting up our own study lab equipment, either virtual like viral or physical in some particular location. It also allows us to draw in other speakers and other donations that they can write things off. So there was a lot of very good ideas uh, by Steve and Matt and Brian, uh, Eric, Eric uh, others at the, at the user group meeting. So we're going to try to take this to the next level and improve upon uh, the success that Ken has already been able to do for the years, and of course Tom has uh, prior to that. Uh, did I miss anything that's kind of key point on the officer meeting? Okay. All right. Mark, you want to introduce our uh, sponsors? Sure. 
Thanks, Bo, and thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, this is a special meeting, again, our 20th anniversary as a user group, the uh, largest and oldest Cisco user group in the world. I wanted to uh, highlight our meeting sponsor tonight, Tech Systems. You may have seen uh, the gentleman back here. Wanted to invite one of them up, maybe Ian Oden, to come on up and tell us all about Tech Systems, maybe a hot rec or something or other. Well, I want to know too many times. I'm sure everybody came up here to hear this, this great topic. Um, Bo, appreciate it to all the officers. Thanks for allowing us to come up here and sponsor this uh, event. 20 years, special thing uh, to go that long. Uh, so I definitely appreciate you guys coming up. So Tech Systems, some of you may have heard of us in the past. Um, some may have worked with us, uh, had phone conversations with us. Uh, we're a staffing and uh, services company. Uh, what does that mean to the majority of you guys in here? As for me, as my perspective is I am a uh, senior technical recruiter. I work specifically with network. Um, so I'm not working a Java rec one day or working a systems rec the next day. I'm constantly working with network engineers, working with engineers within the marketplace to understand what they do, how they do it, um, and what are the new trends that we're seeing from our clients in terms of what skill sets they want to see. Um, there's a couple of us recruiters up here, as well as my account manager, Jimmy Ashburn, who actually works for uh, Cisco as account manager. So we do work with about 82% of the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, so our cards are back there, so feel free to grab them as you leave. If it's a situation you're not currently looking, uh, that's okay. We're not somebody that's going to pressure you into a new role or we've got some requirement. Uh, we make sure that we are not requirement-centric. We make sure we are consultant-concentric as well as with our clients, ensure that we can match you in future dates, um, whether that be a year from now, whether that be you're looking, currently looking for an opportunity at this time, um, feel free to contact us within any given time frame, and we'll be able to give you conversations, a market <clears throat> landscape, uh, skill sets that we're seeing, as well as you know rates and what current uh, you know demands within your skill set uh, is out there. So feel free to take our cards, contact us, send us your resumes, connect with us on LinkedIn, questions, concerns, feel free to reach out to us. It doesn't cost you any kind of service fee or anything like that to work for us. Um, and from there, we can be able to give you out the uh, different types of uh, you know, market analytics to, to help you guys make the right career decision. So I appreciate it. Again, my name's Ian. Uh, my cards are back there. My colleague back there is Logan Brown. I've already introduced Jimmy Ashburn, and there's uh, Zach Downing, and we all we all work within the network skill set. So any of our cards will be able to assist you in any which way. Appreciate it, guys. That's all right. If I may, I do want to say something about Tech Systems. You know, I've been an officer here for uh, 10 years now as Director of Marketing, and Tech Systems has stand by and supported the user group um, all of those years that I've been attending, more than 10 years. And so I think you guys, if you ever have the feeling to, hey, I want to get my resume out there, I want to talk to a recruiter, Tech Systems is the first name that comes to my mind, and I, I would say make sure it first comes to your mind and, and look them up first. Jimmy and team have supported us very much so over the years as meeting sponsors many a time. So show them your support, reach out to them first. Uh, these are good times and uh, opportunities are there and they can probably help you in the next uh, you know, step that you do in your career. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, when you don't get that big promotion you were expecting, <laughs> it's called an RGE. Everybody know what an RGE is, right? Yeah. Your resume generating event. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> There's also some kind of job, right? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Schedule a cron job. There you go. Uh, if you or your company is interested in sponsoring the Cisco User Group, uh, please uh, look me up or see me if you can grab me. Um, I'm currently looking for meeting sponsors for September and October. Thank you. By the way, the other thing that we'd like to throw out to the the users is that. Topics for presentations uh, is not necessarily just the responsibility of the officer team to come up with ideas. We want your ideas. If you know somebody that would be a good presenter on a technical topic, Mark's the guy that coordinates that. We all feed him our ideas and possible speakers. Please, this is part of making the user group go and grow and get bigger and better. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right. So. At this point, we're going to depart slightly from our usual scheduled program. Uh, Ken, Tom, please come up. Okay.
it's time to cut the cake, <laughs> they're going to blow out the candles. Uh, I'll wait. <laughs> All right, we're going to have them huff and puff and see if they can blow the plastic lid off. So what we're going to do is grab your, grab your plates. We're going to start slicing some cake here. Actually, let's just do two at a time here. We've got chocolate and vanilla. We'll start slicing. Uh, as you go by, there's forks over here. Uh, I'll figure it out this. This is, uh, this is the overflow. All right. Yeah, yeah that's right. As you go by, grab your fork. And uh, as soon as everybody gets a slice of cake, we will start the program. You can who you roll with us. All right. Too many moving parts. All right. Let's go. Come on, my folks. Tom? Oh, well, you're taking videos. All right, Ken. Then uh, we'll start slicing. I think these are chocolate. These are vanilla. Yeah. One of each, if you like. We got. It looks like we're going to have more than enough cake for everybody to have a couple of good slices. Just take your. Uh, Small one. 
for manager? Okay, okay, perfect. But you understand, you know, what is a dollar, right? From another solution, maybe a buy, a genesis, something like that? Okay. So, uh, this presentation is going to last less than two hours. I'm going to actually make a live uh, a demo using my home lab. And uh, if uh, anybody wants to be a guinea pig for, for the dollar to dial out, please uh, write your cell phone on the whiteboard so I can put it in the dialing list. Now let's, uh, uh, and it's fully interactive, uh, you know, you can ask me any question you like. If I cannot uh, answer the question right in the moment, I will put it in a, in a note so we can take it offline, okay? So, a uh, quick agenda, we're going to do a, a, a quick uh, overview. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the dollar algorithm that it uses and the best practices, and also what is CPA, called progress analysis. A little bit of troubleshooting, what is the fault recovery and the, the, the scenarios that we can have on this solution, common problems, questions and solutions, and a quick Q&A. Again, you know, uh, the um, the main thing about uh, the dollar for tonight is for you guys to understand the call flow and uh, how the, the main uh, algorithms and methods are working. We're not going to go too deep into the troubleshooting because it can take hours and hours. But if you, if you get a good idea of how it works, how the lists are important, how the campaign manager manages the campaign, it will be good information. You can actually uh, read more on the uh, on the documentation. So, what is the architecture of the Alban dollar? All right. Uh, this is what again. You know, the, the the people that were in the in the last presentation. It was a little more abstract and, and interactive, actually, you know, writing a call flow. On this presentation, I'm going, I'm going to need the slides because it's, a, you know, more, more about uh, a, the um, understanding of the function. So on the architecture, here we have our central controller that uh, includes the ICM, that is the router and logger, the PGs. We have uh, the, per the PGs, the peripheral gateway. That we have different flavors of it. For the data solution, we want and we need the agent PG that is the one that is connected to our call manager and our media routing PG. The media routing, its name says, you know, is is media routing because it's not actually routing voice. It's routing other type of media. In this case, it's routing messages that are coming from the data. But a media routing can also be you know, a chat solution that can be another type of thing. In this case, it's going to be dollar. So, in the agent PG, we also connect the dollar. It can be here the dollar, the MRPG, and the agent PG. In the same PG, they're connecting to our solution of call manager, so we can transfer the call to our agents. We have our desktops, and for redundancy, we have our SIP. Uh, a COPS. COPS, we don't use it anymore, but it's Cisco Unified Seed Proxy. Very powerful, very powerful uh, um, software that can actually do redundancy and load balancing. And we have on our other side the voice gateways. Voice gateways, you know, traditionally they were TDM, they connect to our service providers, and eventually they will make the call, you know, to the customers. Now we have support for Q, but still limited. The, the service provider can deliver SIP to the queue, and we can outbound SIP, but uh, we cannot yet uh, uh, certify for progress analysis. So if a dollar is not going to be detecting answering machine or live voice, we can use a queue on this solution until 11.5. Right now we're in 11, version 11. Any question on this? This is pretty simple. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, this is this is my area, but I know a number of people that have the Avaya. 
uh, and they hate it, they want to get rid of it. What, what, which pieces replace the Avaya? Tell you the truth, uh, I don't exactly know what is the architecture of the Avaya solution, but uh, basically I think the uh, position of Cisco is about uh, how the predictive algorithm is better than the others. Mm -hmm. So everybody has their own solution or on the predictive algorithm, so we offer one, you know, that is very good. It's actually one of the, you know, top three. I don't know if Avaya can compete on that. Now, the, the thing is that uh, also the dollar includes all the CVP solutions. So if you're going to do an agent-less campaign, you can include all the, all the power of CVP and BXML. I, I don't know about the Avaya solution, maybe. Okay. Well, yeah, but uh, uh, one of the things one of the things that we're going to beat Avaya, you know, uh, uh, horribly, is that on version 11.5, not only we're using Q and CPA over the GTD packet in, in the C packet, we are also going to introduce the API. So we will be able to manipulate the campaign manager, import manager, and uh, the CDP through API. Custom, uh, so, so you can customize this API and input all this information without going into the legacy pro uh, processes. Yes. I was just going to add, so for customers who do have Avaya that they would maybe want to integrate some of this into the Avaya world, one thing that you can do is you can have a Cisco Unified Contact Center Enterprise Agent um, log in as a mobile agent, and they log in as a mobile agent and they point the Avaya phone as their, you know, when they log into Contact Center Enterprise, they basically say, this Avaya phone is my phone, and you put in the dialable number as part of your mobile agent login, and then they can participate in an outbound campaign. But there is no real direct integration of the dialer into the Avaya PDS. Yeah, there's, there's not. As a mobile agent solution, it might work. I don't know if, uh, you know, a customer may want to have that hybrid. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, this, uh, this predictive algorithm is very good. Any other questions? This slide, okay. So, <clears throat> one of the important things here is that, uh, and one, one small limitation that we have in, our, in, in this solution is that only the logger A would have two sides of the contact center, with, uh, side A and side B. We uh, have almost every single process redundant. So we have, uh, you know, our, our rogers that are synchronized on real time, back and forth, A and B. We have PGs that are in idle or standby, always uh, communicating information back to the rogger and uh, in a, in a um, step synchronized. So they are kind of idle, but they are listening in case of a problem. But on the case of the dialer, we have two processes that only exist on, the, on logger A, are the campaign manager and the import manager. So these processes only exist on logger A, so if your call <coughs> center loses logger A, then your dollar solution is going to go down. But uh, as far as that, a SIP dollar, a SIP dollar uh, in, the, in the SCCP world before, we, we had two, two flavors, the SCCP and the SIP. Now the SCCP depended completely of call managers. SIP does not. SIP is just uh, uh, virtual ports that are created in a map and they actually are dialed by our gateways. On the SCCP, we needed these ports to existing call manager. We don't, we don't have that anymore. So the, uh, so the uh, dialer capacity increased greatly. Now, for the uh, SIP dialer, we can have redundant dialers on side A and side B on the same fashion, active and standby. If one of the dollars goes down, the other one will take over, but they will not be active at the same time. And again, just what I was talking, service provider can, can deliver SIP to us and we can dial out SIP, but we cannot detect CPA on the current version. So uh, we're going to have uh, probably a DSP solution in our queue to actually translate that uh, that uh, uh, progress analysis 
into the trip GTV to pass it back to the data so we can actually detect the field live answer, answer machine, et cetera, et cetera. We can, we can do it right now, but it's, uh, it, it has problems. You know, I, I've tested some of the betas and we still have problems. That's why it was delayed until level five. A lot of customers want it, by the way. A lot of customers want it. They already have their, their queue and they want CPA. All right, so on the, on the um, scalability, $2 per PG pair, mm -hmm. one active, one passive, as I was saying, it, it goes all the way to 1,500 ports per data, 60 calls per second, so that's pretty good. Up to 1,080. The data interacts directly with the, with the code that I was telling, or the gateway. CPA is performed on the gateway. This is very powerful too because the gateway is the one that is, uh, that is making the decision of the detection of whatever is hearing on the other side and actually sending that analysis back to the data so the data can classify that call as we want. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of the uh, SCCP data, SCCP uh, is the skinny data that we used to have in previous versions. We have fewer dollars. We only need one to have that capacity. Fewer PGs because we have one PG with uh, one PG duplex with two dollars with the same name. Idle standby, and uh, the predictive mode is actually more accurate because the pool of agents exists only in one dollar, so it doesn't need to share it with another dollar like in SCP mode. <coughs> So uh, the guts of, of the product is like this. We have the logger, as I was saying. The logger, uh, for you guys that have not uh, seen a UCC solution before, the logger is the process in the contact center that actually records everything that is going on you know, with the routing of the contact center itself. We have a router and a logger. The router is the one that is making the decisions uh, uh, to route a call when a routing client wants a label back. So if a routing client, that in this case will be the dollar or a call manager, requests a label to the router, the router in real time will return a label to the routing client. Now, we, have, we need all that information to be stored and the configuration to be stored somewhere. So that is the logger. So a logger on a router, we call it the rogger. So that is the, the central controller part of our UCC, that is the brain. So, so in this case, these two processes for the dollar exist on logger A. We have our import process. That import process, we will see, it is basically what is enforced the dialing list. We have our campaign manager that is going to manage the dialing list and actually classify uh, 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 with the rules that we actually configure in the campaign manager. And all of them will go to a, to a small database that, is, that resides in the logger itself. The logger itself has a logger database that uh, records all what is going on with the contact center. And also, we're going to put there uh, an outbound database to record our dialing list and the uh, status of the calls that we are actually you know, making. Now, uh, the logger communicates with <clears throat> our AW, so we can actually configure the solution. The logger as the router uh, is communicating with the router for all the routing decisions. It's communicating through the external message transfer to the SIP dialer because the data is actually requesting records to be dialed out. Campaign manager talks to the SIP dialer on this, on this uh, messaging. And we have our SIP. Uh, messages coming from the data to the voice gateway to actually making the call. And we have the MRPG, so we can make the route request and, and request an agent or an IVR uh, uh, port. And we have our agent PG, that is the one that communicates with the agent and with the phone. So uh, I think uh, I think this, uh, this picture is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you guys have any question on this picture? <clears throat> Again, this, this PG is our call manager. We have our team talking to our call manager. We have our media routing PG that is the one that requests an agent when we're going to dial out. 
This is our seed data that gets the number from the campaign manager to actually get dialed, and we have our logger that runs those two processes, the import and the campaign manager, and stores the data in the, in the database. Looks pretty simple, huh? <laughs> 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 You will understand it a little in, 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 in the next uh, explanation. So again, import process, you know, is named, say, import is just to import the uh, numbers that we want to, to get dialed. It's actually done through the AW. Actually, in the, uh, in the versions that we have, we have uh, only uh, the option of putting a list in a, uh, in a format of like comma delimiter or pipe delimiter, but it's a text file. It's actually a text file that we put in a location, in a file location that the logger is going to be constantly looking for. So if we configure at the import process to look for uh, uh, a UNC here of a network drive, and we're putting there a list of phone numbers, every, every 10 seconds the logger will go there and scan that directory to see if we have a, 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 a file with the name that we're actually putting here, so it can try to import those records. We put uh, the schedule that we want. Usually, <coughs> usually all the customers, I've never seen anybody schedule an import, but you have the option for, but uh, the common configuration is for the, um, import process to be constantly scanning that path for this file to exist. So if I have a, a, a file called contact.txt and inside that file I have four numbers and I just create it and put it the name that I configure there, the logger will take it and it will rename it to .pack, but those numbers will be taken and imported into a dialing list. One important thing, there's, um, there's customers, big customers, that they have, uh, you know, dozens of uh, campaigns that are going out that they don't want to override their existing list for statistics or for or whatever reason that they have. They don't want those lists to be overwritten. So they append. Now, the problem with that is that, the, you know, in a couple of years I've seen dollars you know, with uh, three or four years of numbers. So it's a quite big data. Now, uh, the other thing is that you need to maintain those lists if you're going to append them, because some of the numbers can be, can be tagged as pending or callbacks, et cetera, et cetera. And if you uh, don't constantly be, you know, uh, cleaning those, those lists, it will, you will actually get calls, you know, from last month that were supposed to be you know, that last month and you were getting it today. And that is because of the order that the dollar, you know, has to dial out. <clears throat> now, uh, the, um, the pending records will be actually the last to be dialed. So if you have records that are still or are fresh import are going to be the last one to be called. We will see the order for that, but uh, that's, uh, that's a big thing. We have a lot of cases of that, of uh, overwritten and appended lists that they are having numbers, you know, called, and they were imported like last, last month. <coughs> now, on, uh, we have this uh, task, the delimited and fixed format. We also have the pipe now. Now, uh, uh, something very important is that Cisco does not support that you actually import numbers directly to the database in the logger. That is going to change with the APIs in, in 11.5, but right now, you cannot just go and do a query and an, and an update or an insert in the database. Uh, I mean, you could if you want, but if you call TAC and you say, well, it's not importing numbers, and I ask you for your dialing list and you don't have one, it's not supported. So all the numbers, what I'm trying to say is that all the numbers need to come from a dialing list and the import process importing them. already talk about this. So basically this is the process. This table is, is very simple. 
you get a CSV or a text file in the class that, I, that we just configured. We have a target table name, it's called test or customer one or collections, whatever. And we have a dialing list table. This dialing list table is created with the import rule ID and the query rule ID that makes the name for the dialing list table that you can actually look for it when you're looking for these numbers and your region prefix matching. Now, how the how the dialer knows if you put a if you put a, a time zone of central, how the dialer knows not to dial Pacific if in central it's already 9 a.m. and Pacific is 7. Mm. Or here is 8 and over there is 6 a.m. It does it because of the prefix matching. So, I mean, there are a lot of rules, the golden <clears throat> rules, that a dialer cannot, you know, dial, or, you know, in the middle of the night, stuff like that, or they do not hold it. All these, all these uh, uh, decisions of not dialing out are made in the campaign manager, but the region prefix matching is made in the, in the import process, and it's actually written in the database as which time zone the number is supposed to get that is done by the import process. Okay, well, question. question. Yes. That uh, region prefix, are you saying that's like the area code of the phone number, or is that a completely separate tag? Because in today's world, with cell phones and everything else, you know, I might move to California, but I still have a 972 Dallas area yeah. code Central Time Zone. How do you deal with that? Well, uh, it's, it's not an easy uh, way to deal with that situation because we do depend on the on the region the prefix. Mm. Yes. So So that brings to mind the old Texas Aggie saying of nothing difficult is ever easy. <laughs> exactly. Okay, that's where exactly. you are. On that. So in, in the configuration manager we can actually alter the region prefix and customize it for you know for your needs and everything. But we have a default region prefix for the entire US and uh, the numbers that are input are supposed to obey by those prefix. Now, there's a way to override that behavior. If you go to the logger and you modify a setting, you can actually make the dollar dialed out with the logger time in the time zone. But you know, if if it is if it is actually uh, you know a, a campaign that you're running it locally, it might work. But if you're you know, over the entire country, it may not. So those things you will need to decide how you deal with them. Maybe maybe a campaign with all the 972s in a separate dialing list for a campaign that are 972s that the region prefix can be matched uh, and, and not to mix other type of prefix. It's, it's, uh, it, it will be up to you. Can you not that was me. Trouble? Okay. Can you I don't start with the same problem as last week. No, no, uh, last no one, yeah. Okay. Ricardo, question. Another question. You got a question back here. Can you not control the hours that it dials? Yes. So that maybe you dial between Correct. 9 and whatever. Correct. You, you have, you All have, time zones. Yes. You have a two target configuration. So it can be target one and can be target two. So you control the hours that you want the dollar to be active for that particular campaign. So you can dial, uh, let's say, from 10 to 12, then take a break, and then dial from 2 to 4, something like that. You have two options of doing that, yes. But, but if you find, if you're in California and you, or, uh, and you find a 972, even though, even though your campaign uh, you know, is set to dial for that, but the region prefix is denying that because of the prefix, it will not get that. Yes. What about places that are not observing daylight savings time, like the state of Arizona or like the city of Detroit? Uh -huh. right. What do you do when it's, you know, real localized places like that? So, so the, actually, the dollar has a, a, a savings some uh, savings time configuration. So it will take that into consideration. Okay. The 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 prefix that uh, do not have that thing. So uh, real quick, let's go through this. You know, it, this is how it works. It imports the file. You know, as I, as I told you, you, you have a network file here. 
this results in the logger. It goes and it finds the file. It's scanning that, uh, that uh, directory. I found a file with the name that I configured. Then I'm going to build my dialing list. I'm going to insert one record. Then I have a table name. The table name, again, is the one that I named it in the configuration. And then the file is uh, renamed from txt to .back. So when you see in that directory the dot back, it means that the file was imported. Any question on the import process? Could you answer how you get it exported to maybe change and import again? That, uh, that, that's a great question. So we don't manage the dialing list per se. So the customer is the one that does that, and they just build a TXT file and put it for the import process to do it. Now there's uh, third-party solutions to do that, and uh, they can uh, they can manage all the all the contacts, even contacts that have been dialed and had a had a status code that uh, they were busy or they didn't answer, they need to redial. That is done by a third-party solution, and they will rebuild the list and put it back. We don't we don't manage the list itself. But you also it sounds like don't have an export tool to do the opposite of the import. Yeah, no, 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 no. We we just have that text file and we read from that text like text file to build the dialing list. That's all. Yeah. If 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 you want an export of the number that have been dialed. And the and the uh, reason code or, or the termination code, the, the the TCDs, you can actually export it right from the database. Okay, so let me ask this question: If you've been doing this for a while, you probably started to run out of some storage. <coughs> How do you clear your prior imports to have room for more? Yeah, so so the 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 um, outbound the outbound database has obviously a finite uh, a capacity. You, you configure that when you're actually installing the system. And that's what we were talking about, that uh, you can actually choose to, to append or to override your dialing list. If you override, all that information will be cleared. And the new information from the next dialing list will be imported. If you choose to append, then as I was saying, you will need to manage that database yourself. So just to be sure that uh, you know you still have space, et cetera, et cetera. We do have cases when uh, you know there's no more space, and they call back and say, you know, my dialer is not dialing. We go and we see the the database, and it's full. So we tell them either you back up this database, or you clear some space on your database, add more space on the database, so the dialer can uh, continue importing records. That answers your question? Thank you. So uh, campaign manager. This is the other process that uh, runs in the logger. I'm just going to go through it uh, real quick. So what it does, it reads the dialing, uh, dialing list tables based on the query rules. So we have, we have a way to configure query rules based on <coughs> formulas that we can build. We can build a formula of uh, how many digits the phone has, or you know, if it is uh, a X, Y. I mean, we have a, a lot of variables. I, I will show you where to build the formula, and that is the query rule. So we can, uh, we can actually uh, get a more intelligent decision of which numbers are going to be targeted to get that. So, uh, something very important, it filters out the numbers that are in the do not call list. Again, you know, uh, governance is pretty specific on the do not call list, and uh, companies can get fined for that. Yes, sir? Well, I'm not uh, do not call list. I get called all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, do, they do they actually enforce that at all? Yeah, well, you, you, can go, you can go and file a complaint. You, yeah. you, can, you can file a complaint. There's, uh, there's uh, several. Yeah, I, I file complaints. I don't think they do any of yeah. yeah, some things don't have to obey the do not call list, though. Yeah. So yeah, but uh, for for our product, we yeah. we we have, we need to have that option. Oh no, I agree. I agree. I'm just answering his question. That yeah, no, yeah, they have the dialer in place, but they don't have to obey that. Some yeah, exactly. But it's not Cisco fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm talking about like on a commercial 
you know, like asking for roofing, for instance. Like, yeah. I can call us all the time for that. Or scammers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, cetera, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, these, these guys are, some of them are not obeying the law, right? So. Do you think enough to my company's family's sound on my cell phone and make the other, the other end think that I'm a fax machine? Uh, probably you can, yes. I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or yeah, or answer. You know, uh, police station. Say your emergency. Yay! See if they call again. Tell him you work for the phone company and are reporting him. I promise you, they'll stop calling. Ask me how I know. Yeah. <laughs> so so anyway, we have a do not call list, and we actually import that do not call list. So the campaign manager is always uh, trying to match the number that is uh, that is. Uh, uh, that is working with or importing to that do not call list so it can be skipped. Uh, it updates the dialing list every time that we get a result from outbound attempts. Now we can configure retry. So every time that uh, the call is retried, there is a record of what happened with the previous call. So those updates are made by the campaign manager and it actually updates the dialing list. So, verifies that the campaigns are executed with the parameters that we define and uh, passes the configuration data to the dollar when it starts the PG. So the dollar, everything that it runs, it runs on memory. So when the dollar <coughs> is fired up and is connected to the, uh, uh, to the system uh, or to the logger, the, the campaign manager is the one that downloads the configuration to the, to the dollar. Again, it resides on logger A, there's no redundancy. And uh, uh, the campaigns are set up and configured in the configuration manager. We will see an example for that. Any question on the campaign manager? Okay. So uh, there's five tabs to configure the configuration manager. You see the, uh, it's very small, but uh, you can actually see a little bit. You have uh, the name of the campaign. We have a couple of parameters here that I want to define in the uh, mode that you're using. We have four modes. Uh, we will discuss them in a little bit, but uh, it's uh, our predictive, progressive, is preview, and direct preview. So you configure some of the parameters for, for the progressive and predictive over there. You, uh, also, there's the dialing settings. Uh, uh, what is the limit of the ring li uh, of the rings that you want, the maximum attempts, what is the wait time for the abandoned calls, and you configure your retries right there. You can also uh, configure callback settings. We have two callbacks that we're going to talk about uh, in, in the next slide. What is the callback that the system does that do does not require a specification? And we have one type of callback that is called the uh, personal callback that an agent can be tagged, you know, to continue dealing with that call in the future. The campaign purpose, we have two, two types of campaigns. We have the agent base and we have the IBR. They also are called agent or agent less. So we configure here what type of campaign it is. It is an agent base or it is a, an IBR campaign. And here is where you configure your call progress analysis. If you configure your call progress analysis right here, then you, com then, then you need to configure what you want the CPA to do after it detects something, right? If it, if it detects uh, uh, an answer machine detection, A and B, you want to abandon the call or you want to transfer it to an IVR, and for the agent campaign, you have that option too. Now, those uh, CPA parameters are, uh, the Cisco, you know, recommends some parameters that are kind of generic and <coughs> works good with, you know, some regions, but that is entirely, entirely up to fine tuning the dollar. And uh, I have a, an entire section on how to tune it up. We're not going to go through this section because of timing, but if you ever deal with CPA tuning, you can uh, go to back to these slides and, and know how. You have the query rule selection. You actually build a query rule in the configuration manager and you include that query rule here in the campaign 
and uh, another <coughs> uh, some other parameters that you can actually configure what is the penetration of the call list that you want to cut in the time that you are actually dialing out and the power rate and some others. Uh, the uh, skill group selection, obviously, uh, if you have an agent campaign, you are going to configure skill groups. So you're going to have, you know, the collections and the marketing and et cetera. All those skill groups for those numbers that you're dialing out, depending on, on what you're doing with this campaign, you configure the skill groups of the agents that are going to receive those calls that you're getting out. Now, in this skill group uh, selection, you also configure the dial numbers of the scripts that you're going to hit when that number is dialed out. So if I configure uh, a query rule selection to import this list, and this list is for collections, I'm going to configure a skill group that is for collection and a dial number that is going to run the script, the ICM script for collection. We will see an example of that. And uh, what you were asking, the call targets, we have two options. We have some one and some two. We actually configure the savings, uh, daylight savings zone over here uh, for, for, uh, for the time zone that uh, the dialer is running. And we configure how many numbers we need to dial out. So it, it goes sequentially, so it, it's going to try to dial the first number and then the second and then the third. You can, I don't know what's the limit of that. It says 10, I've never seen 10 work before. For two or three, I've seen customers configure three phone numbers in the dial and list. And if, it, if, if the first one you know, is marked as uh, BC, it will try the second or third. You configure all that here. So how's the campaign manager process? We have this, the, the SIP dialer. Is going to request an agent. The MRPG is going to talk to the router and say, I need an agent. We go and we go to the reservation agent script that we will see an example. So basically, we will hit this dial number, whatever dial number that we configure here, and we will go to that script and we will go for the start. Then uh, uh, this is very simple script. We'll go to the long available agent. If we find an agent, we will get back to the MRPG, a label with the agent that we have selected for that call, and we'll get it back to the dialer. Actually, the agent, agent gets reserved before the call is out. And, and why is that? Because if we're using predictive dialing, the dialer is predicting how many lines it has to dial out in order to have the best chance to land in an agent. So uh, let's say if I, if I have a, 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 a ports per agent uh, of five that the predictive <coughs> algorithm is choosing to dial, it's going to dial five calls and reserve one agent because that's the chance, that's the statistic that we have of one of those <coughs> to get answer and hit the agent. That is predictive dialing. Now, if you configure progressive dialing, you're going to dial out five regardless of the statistics that the dollar is collecting to uh, increase or decrease the amount of dollar per agent. So uh, here, real quick, how, how the traces we identify the skill group that we have. We have the call status zone and the uh, dialing list that you see right there if there are callback records or not. Uh, if we find records, we put the records in pending, and uh, we tag those records with the dial, the time zone that we are supposed to dial out. Then uh, we validate the time range, and if it is not in the do not call list, if it clears that, then the uh, number is selected, process to the update to the download uh, uh, list with a record of eight that is active, and then the record is sent to the dialer to be dialed out. All that is done in the campaign manager before the number goes to the dialer, because if the, if the number goes out to the dialer with an eight, it's going to get dialed out. 
So uh, let's say the dollar uh, uh, dialed that number is going to send the result code back for that call back to the campaign <coughs> manager. In this case, we, we, in this example, we got a call result of 10. That means live answer. We have all these codes, you know, in a, in a table, and uh, campaign manager is going to close that record as dialed successfully. This is best understood once we see the live example, but uh, this will get in your mind and you will, you know, relate it later. Any question on the campaign manager process? All right. So uh, for managing the list, <coughs> we have these uh, uh, third-party tools that, uh, you know, they do a lot of stuff and they build all those lists and they manage all those contacts and et cetera. You know, we have uh, Aquarium that is very uh, used now these days, that what they do is manage uh, dialing lists, you know, from results that they get from our own database. So they go and query the database, store procedures, et cetera, et cetera, and they decide which numbers are needed to get dialed out again. So they build another dialing list and they put it back to the dialer. And that is done by Aquarium. Or Ali solutions and uh, uh, and some others, but uh, those third-party solutions are the ones that do that. Now uh, again, right now limitation is that even Aquan or Ali or some others they cannot go to the dial the, the, the dialing list itself and insert records. They have to go to the list text file. They have to put a text file. If we find that this inserting directly to the database is not supported, it's going to change on 11.5, and we're going to have this brand new API that hopefully I can talk about in three or four months. It's all Java, so <coughs> et cetera, and we can mess up with the, the, with the database ourselves. So uh, we, uh, in the import process, we uh, configure a path and we just configure a name. And once you copy the file to that directory, whoop, the logger takes it. It's a scanning that folder all the time for the existence of that name. So if I put test.txt test and I copy it to that folder, the logger will get it, match it, import the numbers, and rename it to .back. So the file could be on any network accessible Correct. system Once, in if, the enterprise. If the logger is able to map that network file, <coughs> it can be anywhere. So uh, <coughs> we have four types of campaigns. We have the progressive, that is same number of calls started each time an agent becomes available. This is very good for IVRs, because you know they don't get tired, right? Uh, so it is using one port to, you, to reserve the agent, and it's using N ports, the ones that you configure to dial out. That is very important to understand. When you configure the ports in the dialer, you need to think by two. So if you're going to dial out 100 ports, you need 100 on this side, for your IVRs and your agents. So you need to configure two hosts. We have the predictive the, uh, that uh, the, the calls are started with a seed that we configure as our base number, but with, with the uh, statistics that the data is gathering from all these calls, it adjusts the ports per agent dynamically. It does it every two seconds in small increments. We're going to talk about that because that is the signature for Cisco's predictive algorithm. We have our preview data that is another type. Preview data is uh, actually actually the system presents to the agent the uh, record that is going to get dialed and the agent chooses to dial that record or not from the desktop. There's two flavors of that. We have the preview and the direct preview. The difference between those is that in preview, if you click accept, I want to dial that record, the dialer is the one that is going to do it. 
and detect, you know, CPA in case you want, et cetera, et cetera, and then connect the call back to the agent. Or we have the direct preview that the direct preview is actually the call is made by the phone, so the dialer doesn't participate. It's, it's just delivering that record, but it does a statistic back to the database. So direct preview, actually the call is coming out from the PDX, in this case, call manager. So the phone itself is making the call, not the dialer. Any yes, sir. Are the ports akin to like zip channels or? Yes. Okay. So, so in this case, a port is just, uh, uh, let's say it's just a virtual number. It's just a number. The, 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 the final count that you want to know is the bandwidth that your system can take. Okay. So, I mean, you can configure 2,000 ports, but if you have this bandwidth, you know it's going to fail. Right, right. So it's, it, it's, just, uh, it's just a port that you can configure per bandwidth that you have. That port number so like right? what layer of your 64K time? channels? Uh, excuse me? Are they like 64K channels then, or is it? Uh, I mean, uh, it, it all depends on what you're doing, uh, you know, to dial out or... or, or what codex? Or the codex, okay. yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, but uh, usually, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we support, I think, uh, 711, so 729 now. So you can configure, right. uh, you know, depending. Usually 729, but if yeah. someone really wants it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. What, what's that codec that's really, really low bandwidth utilization that makes your voice sound like Stephen Hawking? <laughs> Is it probably 722? <laughs> no. <laughs> probably not too useful. Yeah, on, on, on voice calls, we don't want to go below 729, otherwise it will be crappy, you know. Right. Even even at 711, sometimes it's like, you don't understand or you don't want to understand the difference. It doesn't matter. What layer of CUSI is that port number? That, that is an application port. It's just a number. So it's all the way to the application layer. Yes. When it, when it actually, when, when the uh, number uh, is sent to the dollar, then then the um, uh, the application builds the zip message to get it out. <laughs> it's important the the dialer these ports are logical ports. They're not actually ever touching the media. The dialer has a logical port in its mind saying, oh, I want to make a call to these three phone numbers, and through the zip proxy. Call number one might go out gateway one, call number two might go out gateway two, call number three might go out gateway three. And the call progress analysis is done in the DSP resources on the gateway. They're touching the actual media, and then they give the results back, answer machine, live answer, fax machine, and then the dialer decides what to do with the call. But the dialer port is <clears throat> a logical concept. It doesn't touch the media. Tyler, just a number. That makes sense. Tyler, yes, sir. Yeah, do you have a way of detecting uh, cascaded codecs so that, uh, say, you talk to someone on a cell phone mm -hmm. and the voice quality to the person you're listening to is really poor because it's, you know, encoded, encoded. Uh -huh. do you have a way to drop back to a higher bit rate no. ECM? No, no. Once, uh, once uh, the uh, setup of, of uh, whatever, we don't touch those, sent those uh, devices, by the way. You know, the, the, the uh, setup of the call must be between our queue and uh, if we're using C, a C provider, so the C provider and the queue, you know, once the call set up, we establish the coders that could be negotiated. But once we okay to use one coder, we cannot just go back and forth depending on, you know, what we're detecting on the line, no. So if uh, we agree to use 711, the call will be 711 all the way or, or vice versa. You sit there and go from let's say 729 to uh, T38, and then go back to 729. Um, I don't know. I I will need to research. I'll, I'll put it as a as a uh, item. Best okay. best practice is usually that you're trunking. I mean, if you're doing analog trunk, I mean like TDM trunking, it's a PRI channel, so that's. Yep going to be the equivalent of 711, but if you're doing SIP truck, best practice is you're doing 711 coding. Correct. You don't want to compress the voice packets, 
because your call progress analysis won't work as well. Gotcha. If you start stripping out data from that voice, you're going to get more false live answers or false answer machines. You want a, a G711 quality. Exactly. What I don't know is, I forget. So I have a G711 sit trunk, mm -hmm. and I get a live answer, but my gateway is across the wide area network. Can I have that go 729 after I get the live answer? Uh, yes, because, <coughs> uh, because the, uh, the detection is actually marked on a, on a header. So we already did the detection. We can negotiate all the calls back uh, to the other side. Right, okay. We can do that. Now, uh, remember that we cannot do CPA just yet because it's not supporting our queue. So if we want to use CPA, we need to have a PRI. So we have a PRI on, a, on our uh, <coughs> gateway, and then we have our SIP drone back to the data. I thought it was supported already. No. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not. It's uh, an 11 file. No, it, it didn't, it, uh, you know, it, it didn't make it on 11. Yeah, I'd say it's a moving target. Yeah, it's a, exactly. I, I it, it, it was supposed, you know, I tested a better solution on 10.5, and it worked sometimes, and it didn't work some of the times. I, I opened a book for that, and they told me, it's like, close it, because we're not going to support it until 11.5. Like, okay. They had, a, they had a problem. And you need to configure DSPs on that queue to do that, uh, that uh, conversion. So, so yeah, if, we, if you want to do CPA, Right now, you need to have PRI on that side. We will detect it and we will pass the CPA result in a SIP header back to the app. And we have a tag right there to tell the dollar that that is the detection. Okay. Looking at your the different boxes there for the, the different algorithms, looking at like progressive, you may have the one agent with the one port to use to reserve the agent and then say five ports to make five different calls. Mm -hmm. if, if three of those calls actually pick up, what happens to the other two? You know, they, they will get disconnected. Okay, so they'll throw them into a queue for another agent? And just yeah, no, no, no. Well, exactly, exactly. So so that's, uh, that's how predictive works, right? The, the, the prediction is not set on that we're going to predict that an agent is available. We're predicting the rate that an agent can take off. So we dial five and one gets connected and the other one by lock, you know, the other four gets connected, the other all four will get disconnected. So now that will be an abandoned call. So the dial will take that into consideration not to cross the threshold of an abandon rate that you have and will, you know, reduce the, the uh, ports per agent, so we're not dialing out and getting all these funds. Are you going to document that those phone numbers actually work? Yes. And yeah. They get back to so the dialing list that. saying, you know, this was abandoned, you know, with this code needs to dial again. Mm -hmm. You can't send those abandoned calls to an IVR? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So. Uh, you decide what you want to do with the with the call. You know, if you don't have a, a you could kind of so, do it. You could send okay. them to the IVR so and say, "I'm sorry, we're trying to reach you, but no agents available. Yeah, you can hold temporarily." You know, there are laws out there that say what you can and can't do in each state already. Also, that come into play. We, we, we can look. I uh, think. So what we, what what we want to do with an abandoned call? But yeah. What is <coughs> I think a really good process would be if you got an abandoned call, you then put them in a preview kind of campaign to have a personal person <coughs> call for that. There's nothing worse than getting a telemarketing call followed by another telemarketing call. That's quite annoying. If I get another call, I recognize, like, hey, I'm sorry we tried calling you a moment ago. No one was available. Yeah. I'm going to have a lot of respect for that organization, but telemarketing companies, I guess, don't really care. Yeah, especially the, the, the ones that offer cruises, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or the, uh, oh. the, the timeshare type people. So anyway, uh,
as I explained, we have two types of callbacks. The scheduled uh, callback that is uh, that is marked to a customer after the, the campaign actually reached them. If you want a callback from them, it can actually go to any agent of that skill as a callback. We have the personal callback that that call is scheduled for a particular agent, so you can actually mark that call that wants to come back to me, and uh, you know, and I set up the time and the date of that callback to be made again, and that callback takes priority over other things when I'm online. How is that, is that configurable by the agent that takes or makes the call? Yes. Okay. Yes. So they can say, I need to call this person back in one week. Correct. Okay. Yes, so, so the, the agent, either in finesse or, you know, whatever desktop or CAD or whatever, you can have that, uh, you know, the little, uh, you know, schedule or the, right, right. The, to put the date and the time. Yes. Okay. Okay, campaign scripting. Let's go real quick on this one. Administrative script and the agent reservation script. So the administrative script, I think, is going away in the 11.5.2. I won't say anything about that. Sorry. The, uh, so it is, this is used to control what type of campaign is being run. So on the administrative script, you actually configure which skill group you're going to be using and what type is going to be uh, your campaign. You do that, and uh, I'm going to show you that. So these administrative scripts in ICM, they run all the time. So you actually configure a schedule or you can actually uh, put the system to run by X amount of minutes and, and it doesn't need a call to run. So just running and running and running and running. That's an administrative script. Now for an agent reservation uh, script, you actually need a dial number. So it's a dial number that you configure in the campaign that that dial number is going to hit this script, and then the script that you're going to manage the reservation script. Now, in the reservation script, uh, you cannot know which agent that call is going to get because imagine if you were getting five calls, we're reserving the same agent, but uh, you don't have all the call variables in this reservation script that you can pass to the connected call to the agent because we don't know which call is going to get connected. So it's a reservation script just to get into the skill group. So as I was telling, the administrative script, you configure what type is going to be, predictive or progressive, and the uh, skill group name. This is a, a, a basic example. And a reservation script that you have the DN that you're hitting. If you have a personal callback, it's going to identify it and try to look for that agent on that skill group if it is logged in and make that call first. Or if it is not, then it's going to the longest available agent and push it to the queue. I've seen some uh, real complex reservation scripts, you know, to try to input data in, a, in another database so it can be retrieved, you know, later, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, pretty much this script, what it does is just send the call either to a personal callback or to a skill group. That's all it does. So uh, these are the difference. The agent campaign, the goal is to connect an agent to the customer. An IVR campaign is to play a recording, you know, uh, uh, to a customer or, or answer machine. And some of the best practices, you know, how to configure an agent campaign. You know, if you want to set the answer machine to IVR for that treatment, uh, your question uh, about, uh, you know, what to do with the abandons right there. Uh, or, you know, the best practices for the IVR campaign. I, I usually always, you know, like the IVR campaign to be progressive because we don't need to predict, you know, if the IVR is ready or not. We already know how much it's going to take, you know, for the message to play. But, uh, but uh, any questions on this? Okay. So what is the dollar process? So we talked about import process.
process. We talk about the campaign process. Now we need to talk about the dollar process. So what the dollar process does? Reserve agents. If those reserve agents have, it actually asks the MR team to go to the router and send an available agent. The dollar communicates directly with the gateway via SIP or a cost. <coughs> it performs the call classification, the BC answer machine, etc., etc., and pass the result to the campaign manager. Remember that the uh, CPA is talking <coughs> the gateway, and that header that is called XSISCO header or XSISCO one, I can remember, is just a header that goes in the SIP message. It goes to the dollar, and the dollar does that classification for the call. The detection is done in the gateway. It actually balances port usage between the different campaigns based on agent availability and scope and skill groups. Now, this this is the predictive algorithm itself. It uh, it has a pool of numbers, and uh, all these numbers and the amount of ports that each campaign is using is managed by the dollar. It cannot be configured statically. So if you want a campaign to have 20 ports and the other one to have five assigned to it, you cannot do that. The dollar is the one that is making that decision. So that, that takes right there, you know, the uses of best practices. So in case you have a very big campaign with a lot of agents and you have a very small campaign with very few agents, obviously this small campaign is going to start because it's not going to have enough ports to dial up because the other one is taking off. So either you manage to have different skill groups so you can lower the, the uh, size of the campaign and to assign ports to other uh, smaller campaigns so they will not start. Adjust the predicting campaign ports per agent to keep abandon rate lower. Now, uh, obviously, in any predictive algorithm, uh, the predictive algorithm works better with more data. So if you, if you input numbers to the dollar and you let it run for some time, you're going to have a better accuracy of how it's supposed to be dialing <coughs> instead of the dollar you know, having just a small set of data, then it doesn't make sense to have a predictive because it's not going to be predicted very well. and it resides on the P. So how it works? Call flow agent campaign. <clears throat> we, we put the text file in the logger. The import takes it and makes the dialing list. We, we build our dialing list with all, this, with all the rules that we want. Then the, the dialer requests those records from the campaign manager. Then, when we have numbers, the dollar requests an agent to the central controller to the MR PIM. The route request is sent to the central controller. The router identifies an agent available in that skill group and sends back the route request. This is only a label of the agent. And then the agent is reserved. You will see in the desktop that the agent is reserved. Then the dollar dials the gateway connects the customer. Are we using CPA or not? And then the call is transferred to the agent. This is pretty much the entire flow of uh, an agent campaign. Now remember, remember that the gateway is using two ports. One for the agent and one for the customer. Any question on this call flow? This is very important to understand the solution. You learn it faster than me. <laughs> me like are each of these uh, uh, major points, are those all in one server or are those each of uh, individual? Box. No, depends on the size of your solution. So uh, you know you, you can uh, you can have a small solution and you can have like a logger. So the logger will will coexist with the router. So this router 
and this logger will be one box, right? This PG will be another box, but in this PG, you have actually the dollar, so this will be in the same box as this one, and you have your gable. So in a very small solution, you will have two boxes right here. Or in a big solution, your logger will be one machine, another machine, another machine, and another machine. So it all depends on the size. In, in, you know, in a lab environment like I have, I have a sprawler, so everything is one. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, uh, so the IBR campaign is even easier than the other one. We get a text file, we import the dialing list, we get the campaign manager to arrange our dialing list, the dialer request records, we place the call out. CPA is performed, and then, and then, only then, we go to the central controller to lock in with the CVP. Okay. So the call is connected, and then I run a script that is like, okay, I have this DN, I connected the call, and then give me my CVP, and then I play the script back. In the previous scenario where you Reserve the agent in a predictive mode. Mm -hmm. When that agent is finished with a call, do they have to be reserved again, or do they just stay like in a campaign reserved type safe mode? So uh, you can configure any wrap up that you want. So it, it will just for the agent is just uh, just another call, basically. But let's say that you know they finish the call, they finish their wrap up, and then they you know. They're, they go back into like a ready state or whatever, but yes. does the software go and actually have to go reserve them again? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Every time that a call comes in, you will see they're ready and then reserve. Well, they actually need to be reserved before the dialer starts dialing. For Correct. Them. Exactly. So it has to go do that every time. Every time. Every time the agent finishes the call. Correct. They need to be re-reserved again. Exactly. It's, it's not a nail connection. It is. It is uh, That's kind working. of what I was. Exactly. It's not nail. Every time it goes and reserves it again. Any question on the IVR campaign? Again, you know, uh, we do the same thing as the agent, but uh, before we actually get a number, because we don't need an agent here, we just dial the number out, and depending on the result. Then we go and get the IVR. All right. Now this used to work with uh, IP IVR in the past. We don't longer have sold CVP. Now very important is that CVP here. Uh, for the folks that have worked with CVP before, this is a type 2 CVP. Type 2 means that it's a uh, translation router, it's not correlation ID router. That means that every time, we will see it in my example, that means that every time I hit the script for route, what I'm going to get back from the central controller is a label. That label is actually a uh, DNS from <coughs> CVP to make a pre-route call and connect the script. Because if you see it here, if I make a route request to the, to the central controller, who is making that request? The dialer, right? The dialer. So for the, for the central controller perspective, I'm getting a route request from the dialer to give a label back. So what I'm going to get back to the dialer is a DNS because I cannot give a, a VRU leg, it's not a CVP. So what I do is I return a DNS back to the C dollar, and this, the C dollar will have that DNS configured in the gateway to go and hit the CVP. In CVP, we have a table that we configure those numbers as DNS, and it will match it, and then it will go back to the original request and say, Okay, I received the DNS. Now send me the VRU label so I can connect my script. I don't know if I confuse you more than. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> let me let me write it down real quick. 
So I have I have the dollar right here. The dollar. So I go to the central controller, and this is the, <coughs> the routing client dialer. And I'm gonna hit at the end here. That is, I don't know, 7,000. So here, I'm going to a translation route table that I have, a, I don't know, just a pool of demons. <coughs> right? So I have this. So I'm going to return to the, to the routing client here at 3,000. Then I have configured this 3,000 to go to the gateway and I have a, a dial here with the 3,000 with the IP of the CDP. So I have here my CDP. And I'm going to make a call right here and I have a table of DNS. 3,000, we try some one. So when this number matches this, CDP knows that it's a free call. So it's going to go back to the central controller and say, okay, I got you 3,000. What I do with it? So what I just did right here is change the routing client. Now this script that I was running here, I changed the routing client now to be the routing client. <coughs> so this, this, the central controller sees that the free call connected to 3000 for this routing client. So I'm going to get back a VRU label of the 10 digits. CDP will know that all these sevens is to go to the VXML gateway and will send back the call if it is an ingress and a VXML and will fire up bootstrap vehicle to connect the VXML app. So the call, we have the call here for the customer will connect it back to the CDP and eventually to the VXML app. So what we're doing here with this pre-call is changing the routing client to CDP so we can have a VIU label back to CDP so CDP can connect the VXML gateway so we can access the VXML app. <coughs> Any questions on this, please? It's a, I know it's a little bit confusing, uh, you know, the, the, the previous class that we did about CDP, you know, we needed to draw the, the code flow, how CDP works with routing clients and VRU labels, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is part of the translation route that we were talking about then. But uh, don't, don't get too confused on this. The only thing that I want you to understand is that when the dollar request a, a CDP or an IDR resource, it gets back a DNS, so the DNS will match it to CDP, so CDP can connect the VS XML script. If you want to know the, the mechanics and the codes of how this connection and all these labels work, <coughs> you can take it offline and we can look for that. But for the dollar part of it, you just need to know that the dollar talks to the central controller, Changes the routing plan so we can play the application. Anybody? Bueller? <laughs> <laughs>
we get this invite and we try in and all this stuff, right? But uh, we're not showing the other side over here that is the PRI. So every time that we get something from the PRI, we go back to the dollar. You can see that the CPA analysis is done in the gateway. And the, uh, there's two update messages. By the way, uh, rel 1xx has to be configured because we want those uh, 100 zip messages back to the dollar. That is not supporting CVP, but for dollar is necessary because we want a 183 with SDP so we can send that header to the gateway and the gateway will send us that header back with the CPA, the CPA result. So basically, if you see here, I'm saying I'm going to invite you with a CPA. I want CPA so that header will be there. The gateway will, will, will send back a 183 with a ESDP in the 183, and then this, the corporate analysis will start. It will update the dollar that the CPA has been started, and then it will update back in another zip message with the result of that CPA. This is a, how, how we will do it. Now, how do you think that uh, when the agent is connected to the, 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 the gateway connects the agent in call manager, how do you think the gateway is going to join those calls, the customer and the agent is using a refer. So every time that when this connection is made, the gateway will do a refer and connect this. You see call manager with the invite, gateway, the accept, notifying that he's trying, the okay, the call manager, the phone of the agent will be ringing, notify back, okay, notify again, okay, and they're talking right there. You can go through the, this uh, diagram a little bit, you know, slower when you get the slides. Uh, yes. And uh, <laughs> so, what's the dialing order? Ten That's it. We have ten minutes. Yeah. Plus or minus. All right. So, let me let me see. Okay, so I have a, a, a bunch of slides to go because, again, you know, I, I wanted to show you what are the best practices and the troubleshooting. You can go to the troubleshooting on the slides and everything. I just want you to show my lab to you. So we have 10 minutes or 15. Can you give me five more? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so this is the, uh, the order of the dialing list, callbacks, retry, and pending. You can actually switch that to be a callback and a retry, right? So the dollar will take in consideration always first callback. So that's what I was saying. You know, if I, if I had a retry and I had configured this thing and I have a retry for a, for a phone number that it was <coughs> inserted a month before, you know, and it never had the chance to retry and now it's retrying it, then don't blame the dollar because you haven't purged your dialing list. So let's go here in two minutes. Predictive dialing system uses algorithms to control the ratio of outbound calls to agent. Predictive dialers alter the outbound dialing rate depending on how many connections it managed to achieve. Now, what is Cisco's goal? Make enough outgoing, uh, outgoing calls to keep the agents max, max is that a word? Busy as they free up for, from previous calls without exceeding the abandon rate, what we were talking about. Now, we, we can minimize the abandon rate by different techniques, right? But uh, achieving, you know, a kind of like optimum dialing rate is done by having more data to work with. Now, uh, just uh, a few points on this one. Each Adjustment is made every two seconds, and the 
amount of uh, changes that is done to the ports per agent is minimum. So we don't want a big change. Now, now I'm going to dial 10 for one agent. We just want to amend maybe one, maybe two, depending on the data. So it's better to have an algorithm that has a small increment than a big one. All right, so there's a lot of uh, reading here. You don't have anything else to do. <laughs> <laughs> so now let me show you my dialer right here. So I have here uh, a phone, right? I have here, uh, this is an IVR campaign. You remember those demons that I was talking to you about, the 3,000? I have them configured here, and I have DCN. I have, uh, you know, my application that is Hello World, I sent to VRU, and just a little loop right here. And I have another script That uh, is just a simple one. What it does, just go to that VM, detects if, have a, if I have an agent available, and I transfer that agent to the skill group. So I'm going to configure here a couple of numbers, or just one number, because we don't have time. Who is the winner? 214606? All right. 214. I'm going to turn your volume on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have this list to be an IVR campaign. So what I'm going to do, you see, you see that the list is called CVP import list .txt .back. Now we go back real quick to the AW. This is the script that I'm going to be running right here. This is my dialing number that I was telling you about. And my import rule, you see for my CVP, is CVP import list of TXT. So once I rename it to TXT, it should take it. Now I have right now configured one line for PRI and X for for a cube that I have. But uh, let's do first the one for CPA. So we will see if if it actually works or not. So I put here a couple of things that I can configure, like names, account numbers. So this is for, you know, uh, what I'm doing with those numbers. Then once I, and once I have my dialing list, I save it, and then I'm going to import it. So let's see what it's going to do. Who's 
214 is here. Not Dali. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer and say hello. I'll put it on speaker. So so you didn't hear anything, right? Huh? Okay. So let me let me put my number then. But uh, you know, I want somebody uh, uh, other than me, so you don't think that I'm dialing myself. <laughs> so let me put my number here, and I'm going to put it in the speaker. For <laughs> Four six nine uh, three three six. You were too far. One comma. Oh yeah. Without the comma, not gonna work. Thank you. Okay. So if I save it, I import the disk. Going the wrong way. to log in this agent to extension 1005. So right now you see that it's not ready, right? You see right here that it says not ready? So even if I import a list, it should not call. Okay, go reserve. Okay. Hello? You see that I'm talking. Talking? And I'm connected to the agent. It just took a little while. But you saw that the agent was reserved first, right? Now if I can go, finish the call. And now if I go to my database, just to see what happened. See that my call is 
fix a little bit to update it? my call right here. I just needed to order it. So you see my call, 2035, Samsung 300, completed. Dialing is 15, my number, and call result 10 that it was live. All right. It worked. So there's a lot of uh, reading material over there. You can go through it, and if you have a question, I know there's a bunch of stuff, you know, I try to do my best in, in two hours, but if you have a question, please, there's my email, you know, I can, uh, we can take it offline and, you know, we can go through it again. Where's the reading material? Excuse me, sir? Where's the handout? The <laughs> reading there material. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be posted to the, uh, the site? Oh, yes. Okay. With some links. Yeah. Okay. Great job. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Got the drawings due tonight. Has everybody gotten the tickets? No, no, no. 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 Uh, I, don't worry, I've got your tickets. <laughs> <laughs> who, who needs tickets? <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, you, you already got some already separated. All right, I do. I've got a few here. Van White back here.